welcome to the Den of Tools. Howdy ho, guys and gals. It's Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear, back again here in the old Den of Tools. And today we're going to learn you the truth about hammers. Yeah, your parents should have had this talk with you long before now. Birds, the bees, the hammers, all of that. But don't worry, worry not. Your Uncle DeBear is here to give you the hard-hitting truth. Yeah, but before we jump into that, I just want to remind everyone that over at the shop on denatools.com, we everything still has free shipping, and we're also offering each of my ebooks for only a dollar each. That's the Home Distillers Workbook, Your Guide to Making Moonshine Whiskey, Vodka, Rum, and so much more, as well as the Home Distillers Workbook, Your Guide to Brewing Beer. A dollar each. Those are ebooks again. Uh, if you want the paperback, you have to go over to Amazon to get that. And then again, we have hats and shirts and stickers and the whole nine yards over there in the store. Don't worry, links are down below. But anyway, moving on. Hammers, they've been around for a long, long time. We're talking three million years or so. But they were less the hammers that we know of today and more of what I like to call HSOs or hammer-shaped objects. And uh, that's a, that is, you know, a rock you hold in your hand. The idea for the handle, that was invented by some guy's wife about 50,000 B.C. And she said, you know, get right on that, added it to the honeydew list. He said, you know, I'm getting on it. Don't rush me. I'll get around to it. I'll do it. Don't worry. And about 30,000 B.C., we see him start showing up. And it was basically a stick, uh, often with animal hides wrapped around a stone, uh, adding some leverage to it. And that is essentially the basis of the hammer that we know today. See, ladies, we'll get around to it eventually. You don't, you don't need to harass us about it. You know, any, any century now, we'll, we'll get down to it. But today we see stuff. We've got power hammers for forging, war hammers for <laughs> smiting. We got jack hammers for demo. And of course, for when it's time to party, we got the old MC hammer. Yeah, <laughs> it's in your head now, isn't it? You're humming it. I can tell right now. Yep, the bear did it to you again. Anyway, but today, really, we're here to talk about handheld hammers. The, uh, the handheld hammer is a force multiplier, quite literally. And it is the tool that brought man out of the wilds and into civilization. The, the world you know today was built with a hammer. And the fact is that there's so many types of hammers now, there's no way I can cover them all in one, in one video here. So I'm only going to cover the ones that are truly the most important, the most quintessential, if you will. And the first one is one like that, and that is the traditional curved claw hammer. So it, it, it has several features that you're always going to see. You've got the face, the neck, the head, on the back. Uh, in this case, you're going to have the claw. On a peen hammer, of course, you'd have the peen. The cheek is the side of the, the, the head there. The, uh, the eye is where the handle meets the head. The handle, of course, is the part that adds the leverage and the grip is so it doesn't go flying out of your paws and, and injure somebody. But in this case, the claw hammer, what it's really designed for, and you can use it for all sorts of stuff, but what it's designed for is pulling nails. And that's where it, it really you know, is worth its weight in gold. It puts the nails in, it takes the nails out. I don't know what more you could want. But there's several different iterations, variations, if you will, on this style of hammer. Now, and also this hammer, I should point out, has been around for a long time. This is not something new. This has been around for a couple of hundred years. There's also the straight claw or rip claw hammer. Uh, it's uh, very similar to a framing hammer, which we're going to talk about here shortly. And the, the benefit of this is not only can it take the nails out, and it, but it doesn't do them quite as well, but it can also be used for demo and ripping boards off and stuff like that. Uh, I see a lot of people using it when uh, doing demo in older houses on siding, putting up new siding, that kind of stuff. That's where these things really come into play. Then we've got what's called the, the trim or finish hammer. It's very similar. It's got some slightly different features. One of those is you'll almost never see a textured face on one of these for fear of damaging the surface that you're working on. Often you're going to be looking at working on stuff that's going to be exposed, that's going to be seen. And so you don't want to have that textured face like you're going to see with some of the other styles of hammers, such as the old traditional or what I think of when I think of hammer, which is a framing hammer. That's what I used when I first got into the trades as a carpenter. And it's what I always think of when I think of hammers. Now they have several features that are kind of, they all kind of share. Usually they're a little bit longer. They're 20 to 32 ounces in weight. Uh, most times they'll, you'll see them with a textured face. So it grabs the nail, doesn't slide off, lets you, you set it easier. And very often you'll see it with a nail setter. And that's often a notch, a little bit of magnet there, not much power, just enough to hold the nail. For, so the first swing, you know, kind of gentle sets the nail, second swing, a little more oomph and that finishes the job. 
but they've come up with all sorts of styles and flavors and all sorts of things these days. Now, back when I got started, Estwing rhymes with West Wing. That, that was the hammer to get. That was the end-all, be-all. And I remember thinking this was the prettiest hammer I'd ever seen. But today, there's all sorts of different styles of hammers with different, you know, variations and whatnot. Stiletto, they uh, they were started by uh, Mr. Martinez, and the, he eventually sold them to Milwaukee, I'm pretty sure. They have a titanium hammer or a titanium head on a wood shaft. Now, there's different variations, but that's what the original one was. Uh, and the idea for, by, for that was a lightweight handle with a, another lightweight head on it, lighter than steel, allows you to swing that hammer all day. Now, since he did sell it to Milwaukee, somehow he got out of the non-compete or expired or whatever, and he went on to start another company. And man, I wish I'd heard about these sooner because it turns out I used to live like 30 minutes from them, if that, over in uh, near Merced, California. Well, they're in Merced. I wasn't in Merced, but not too far away. And the point is that he learned that as great as titanium is, it it does have, it, it's usually as strong or even stronger than steel tensile strength. But as far as hardness, it often isn't, it can't hold up to the kind of beating that uh, hardened steel can. And as such, having a hard steel head is still preferred. And then he started replacing the body with a, a titanium body. So, it, I mean, I really love the ideas of these replaceable heads on these hammers. Now, there are also ones that are all titanium. The head's titanium, the body's titanium. If you want to go for the full lightweight, you can do that also. Estwing. I talked to Estwing at the local, uh, one of the trade shows, and I was like, do you have a titanium hammer? And they're like, no, but we heard about those. And they were like, hold my beer. Check this out. Aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> aluminum hammer are you serious but no it's i will say this the thing looks massive all right i picked it up i'm like you who could swing this it looks but it's light because the body of the hammer is aluminum but the face and the claw and you've noticed there the claw is interchangeable the, the face is interchangeable those are hardened steel so you got steel where you need it and then you got lightweight alum, aluminum making up the rest of it it, it's a pretty hefty hammer. It looks kind of cool, I got to admit. Uh, I don't know. You know what? In fact, I, I hate to say it. They offered me one, and I was supposed to pick it up, and things happened, and I didn't make it back to the booth. So, Estwing, if you're out there, I'm really sorry. I I, I was a bad bear. I, I wasn't trying to be mean to you or nothing. I think you have great products. I love Estwing. I'm, I have to admit, and just full disclosure for everyone, the bear is an Estwing fan bear. It, it just, it's one of those things. I've been around them too long all my life. They were, you know, when I was young, that was the one I wanted. When I got it, I loved it as much as I thought I would. And it's always been the, the hammer for me. There may be better hammers out there. I do want to try the Martinez at some point. But anyway, no hard feelings, okay? I say that because we're going to talk about this. <laughs> that is, what, what, I mean, what is that? <laughs> it, it looks kind of kind of unfinished. It's a fiberglass body. So they took this to the next next level. So this is their fiberglass body with a steel head and claw framing hammer that is, I, I, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> Part of me is like, oh, that's kind of cool. Part of me is like, is it done baking yet? I don't, I don't, did you pull it out of the oven too soon? I'm not too sure. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. Let me know what you think down below. I want to hear your impressions of, of this hammer. Is, is that uh, something you'd be looking for? Or is that something you just look at and you're like, nah, no, man, I'm not doing it. All right, enough about framing hammers. Let's get up to the top of the house. And we're going to talk about roofing hammers. <laughs> yeah, you look at this and you're like, okay, it's got a kind of a squarish face. It looks all right. Well, the, the thing is, because you're looking at it in profile. Let me, let me turn it here for you. You can get a better view. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's not broken. I didn't drop it or chip it or chew on it or something. That's the way they come. This is a roofing hammer, and it's specifically designed like that because roofers are crazy. No, they really are. It's <laughs> honestly, I, I I have never been one for uh, like doing shingling and stuff like that. I've laid roofing, but never the style that this kind of hammer is designed for. And I honestly couldn't tell you the best way to use it. 
Uh, now, roofing hatchets, I've seen these around for years and years and years. I know people who swear by them, people who, who use them as their everyday hammer. Uh, so it, the, the, the point of the hatchet is that it allows you to cut shingles, uh, you know, asphalt-based shingles, uh, cut them to size, hammer them in. The little notch down there at the bottom of the hatchet there uh, is, uh, is, is for pulling nails. And then when you're not doing that, you can have, you know, hatchet throwing contests or something. I don't know. I mean, it's a cool tool and all, and there's different variations on this one as well. Uh, there's the one that adds the little blade down at the end. You know, that's the S wing one, of course. And then somebody like uh, the Vaughn one here, they, they take the hatchet to the next level, you know, even bigger, better uncut the whole nine yards. <laughs> I don't know. And then on, on top of that, then we've got something here called a drywall hammer. And uh, it's a very similar style, but it's significantly different. And this is for hanging sheets of drywall, uh, hacking it off. Uh, it's got the nail remover. It's very similar, but it's a very specific tool for a very specific job that I'm not much of a fan of. Actually, you know, hanging the drywall, I'm not, I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't care for it. You know, your hands get all chalky and whatnot. I can deal with it. That's just me, you know, kind of nails on chalkboard kind of thing. But the, the mudding, that's the part I hate. And again, well, you'll see different variations of this. The, uh, the variations are not as uh, wide a field as if you would. They all kind of stick to a similar theme. Now, now let's talk about the, uh, the dreaded ball peen hammer. <laughs> okay, I kid, I kid. So the ball peen hammer, uh, often sometimes referred to, I guess, as a machinist hammer, uh, it basically you've got the one side for doing some coercing and the other side, uh, for doing some shaping, peening of metal. And, uh, there's a couple different, you know, you've got the rounded, you know, the ball of the ball peen hammer. Uh, there's also a cross peen hammer. They, again, you'll have different styles, different shapes. Here's one from gear wrench. They use it. You'll see a lot in uh, mechanics using these as well. S wing of course has, them. Um, uh, that one's, you know, the, the more you'd see, at least what I, what I think of when I think of traditional, at least a modern mechanics, uh, ball peen hammer from, uh, from Capri there. And, and then you got a set of them from Proto where they have different sizes, different weights, that sort of thing. Now we move on to, uh, something that's kind of related and that is the dead blow hammer. Now this one, it's, it's got a pretty scary name to it, but honestly, the, the real, the, it's kind of cool actually. It's got, inside it's got a, uh, usually it's shot of some sort, steel shot. Uh, I've seen them with sand and some other kind of fillers. But what happens is when you swing the hammer, the shot swings with you. But when you strike, it kind of hits a moment later. And what that does is it stops the hammer from bouncing. There's no bounce back. So when you're whacking on something, Rather than getting a lot of the inertia reflected back at you and the and the recoil from that, it all goes directly into the workpiece. It's great for setting things in place. Uh, it works good for coercing, you know, uh, metal parts, wood parts, all sorts of stuff. All sorts of trades use this style of hammer. Why they're always orange, I'm not sure. And I guess so you know it's a the soft you know faced hammer because that's the other thing is it. it you rarely ever see these with a hard face on it. I have seen ball peen style hammers that that are dead blow hammers at the same time. Uh, you don't see them as often, but they are out there. And uh, you also see them with removable faces. So you can put different types of surfaces on it, depending on the kind of strike that you're going for. But again, it's often for setting something in place. Usually it's a, uh, you know, a PC you don't want to get marred or damaged as you're trying to work it in there. And that's why you'll often see the softer face on those. All right, now let's move on to tack hammers. Now tack hammers, much like uh, roofing hammers, that from the side, they're a little deceiving. They look over, overly simplified, if you would. But when you get up close, they often have a split head on them that's also magnetized to hold the tack. And in this case, many times you'll be driving the tack as you're swinging it. It's used uh, very often in carpeting and stuff like that and allows you to set the tack quickly. You can get into a rhythm with it, setting the tack on your hammer, swinging it, putting it in place and moving on. Now again, you're gonna see different variations. Here's a, a claw head variation of the tack hammer where one side is split for the magnetic, uh, uh, placement of the tack and then the backside of, you know, if you mess up, you can remove it. 
Uh, there, here's a, a vintage tack hammer, and you can't really tell there, but it is a claw hammer. Longer, thinner head, because often you're driving it into something uh, that's a little behind things. Some, as I said, like with carpeting, maybe you're trying to get through the pile and down to the weave of it. There's all sorts of reasons why you'd maybe want a thinner head on something like this. Getting into a finish area where you're tacking something up. And also, uh, you know, lighter weight, easier to swing. You're not, you don't need that much force behind it because you're driving a smaller, very, very pointy yeah, little tack. Now, let's talk about, yep, we're going to talk about sledgehammers. All right, not, not this kind of sledgehammer. We're talking about the big boys. We're swinging big iron here. And, uh, you know, there's nothing more cathartic, I think, than swinging away, doing some demo with a good-sized sledgehammer. And you can get them in all shapes and sizes, different handles, wood, fiberglass, and who knows what else. But they're used for everything from, you know, uh, setting things up, knocking things down, demo, and all sorts of good stuff. But they also have a lesser known baby brother, and that's called the drilling hammer. This is also often called a drilling club or a lump hammer. And uh, it's often mistaken for some other tools, but basically it's the baby brother to a sledge. And you're going to see this again in uh, different shapes and sizes uh, with different types of handles, different styles of head. But they usually look very similar in, in head shape to what you're going to see from, with a sledgehammer. You're going to see it in weights from 2 pounds, 3 pounds, 4 pounds, all the way up to you're not worthy. So, <laughs> but there's another, there's another hammer that's very similar to this that often gets confused for it. And that is the engineering hammer. Now the engineering hammer has a much more, uh, it, uh, let's see here. I don't know. Not, I want, it's a different head. Okay. Uh, I was gonna say it's a more machined, a more contoured kind of head. And in, in many cases it is usually has a slightly longer handle, uh, and usually, uh, found in similar, if maybe slightly lighter weights. Again, you'll see this in two pounds. As you can tell there, the handle's a good bit longer. Uh, sometimes you'll see it with a cross pin on the back side of it. Uh, often you'll see it with uh, multiple heads and different kind of variations, which then kind of gets into some confusions as to what people consider really falls into the engineering class. And basically the way I see it is, I see a lot of engineers using hammers like this for certain reasons. And one of the reasons you use a hammer like this is because the different surfaces allow you to strike things with a different amount of force and not cause, you know, marring to the surface. If you're striking something that's a hardened steel, then you can use like a brass face on it without fear of, you know, probably damaging the surface, but also then allowing you to swing it, hit a little bit harder rather than using a nylon face that would absorb a good deal of the impact. And remember, as long as you're using something that's softer than the thing that you're hitting, you're great, really, greatly reducing your ability to damage it. Now, this translates down all the way down into, say, gunsmithing tools. Some people would consider this a smaller version of an engineer's hammer. That that At that point, I don't know. It, it I, I guess, technically speaking, I mean, it's a form of engineering. You're persuading things to get into the place that they're supposed to be. You've got multiple inter interchangeable heads. It seems like a similar concept. I don't know. Would you consider this a part of the engineering class of hammers? I, I guess I kind of do. And uh, then you have multiple soft face hammers as well. These are often considered part of the engineering class of hammers as well. You have varying degrees of hardness with the plastics from very soft up to a considerable hardness, you know, it being plastic and all. And then we go into the specialty hammers. Now at this point, we're, you know, we've covered most of the basic hammers, the really important ones. So we're kind of kind of speed through the rest of these here a bit. And that is like with this one from Tecton here, this is a, a brass headed hammer. And there's a lot of reasons for using these. Two of the biggest reasons are, again, you're trying to persuade something into place that you don't want to mar the surface. Or another one, these are often used in the oil fields by people who don't want to create a spark. And you're not going to spark with brass the way you would with a hard metal striking another metal. And you could probably guess why. They might not want a spark in that, that occupation. And then, 
Then we've got brick hammers, and these are for uh, shaping bricks, is really what they're for. If you're a bricklayer, often you've got to modify a brick to get it into the, the right shape and size. You don't want to always be going back to a saw to cut it down, stuff like that. And you could chip down bricks pretty easily. And the guys I've seen who've really been doing this well, man, they're masters at their art, and they can really take a brick down, down to size here in seconds with one of these. Next up is a bushing hammer. Now, bushing hammers are used in the automotive industry to help get bushings into place on the automotive or on the car, on the vehicle. So when they can wedge it up in there, and, all right, are, are, is everyone running for their keyboards now? <laughs> okay, hold on now. Hold on, keyboard warriors. Ah, the bear is having some fun with you. Now, <laughs> bushing hammers. Bushing hammers are for surfacing uh, mortar and cement and texturing it. <laughs> I, just, I couldn't help myself. I know so many, so many people are always sitting there just waiting for me to, to say something and try to correct me. I, 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 I had to do it. You got you to forgive the bear. Sometimes I got to have some fun up here. Anyway, now they're, as I said, they're for texturing uh, concrete and mortar, uh, adding some surface texture to it. Uh, it's just that simple. Now we've got a chasing hammer. Now these are often used in jewelry. There's some larger ones. There's some smaller ones. Essentially, it's a metal working hammer. Uh, you've got two sides to it. You've got a peen on the back side, uh, slightly rounded, flatter surface up front, and this really unique ha uh, handle on the back. And the reason for that is you're often doing, instead of striking very hardly, you're doing rapid tapping kind of things there, trying to coerce the metal into the shape that you want. And that allows some flex in the handle, giving, making you work less and allowing the hammer to do the work for you. Speaking of metal work, then we've got... A blocking hammer. Now this is a unique hammer used for doming metals and uh, I, this is not something I am good at doing. Uh, I can never quite get them round or something but I've, some, I've seen people do stuff that looks like it came out of a press. It, it, to say that impressive would be uh, <laughs> pushing the, the pun envelope if you would but uh, you know th this is one of those true art form kind of devices that's probably why it looks like it's, you know, used by an artisan because the guys who do that kind of metalworking are just that. They're artisans. Now this, this is a hammer I actually, I had to ask you guys about. I'd heard about electrician's hammers and I was like, is, is it really a thing, an electrician's hammer? Apparently it's not nearly as widely used as it used to be used, but it is a thing. Uh, it has a longer neck on it uh, connecting to the face of the hammer so you can get into an electrical box or whatever it is you're working on. As it was explained to me, I've never used that. Uh, so you can do work in there, nail it to a wall or whatever. I don't know. But that's what it was explained to me for. It kind of looks a little, little goofy, but, you know. Anyway, apparently it's not as widely used as it used to be, but they are still out there. Then we also have blacksmithing hammers. you got to love a good blacksmithing hammer. You got to be careful if you want to get into blacksmithing, you really need to learn proper usage, what what hammer to use. They use lots of different hammers, lots of different hardnesses, because you never want to be striking a hard metal against a hardened metal, because that's how you get metal chips flying. They get embedded in your skin, in your eyes, in your snout, all over the place. Bad things happen. So make sure before you start using a hammers like this that you know what you're doing. Okay, and next up, speaking of swinging hammers, is a linesman's hammer. Yeah, we all knew that they had linesman pliers, but did you know they had linesman hammers? Here's one from Klein. Gotta love the, the Bercules blue they got there. And the use for this hammer is that they, you know, again, it's coercing things into place usually. And the hammer's quite, at least the head of the hammer is quite heavy. And my understanding, as it was explained to me, is that the reason the hammer is so heavy, at least the head is, is that often you're using it in a place that's difficult to get to and you need the hammer to be able to do the work because you don't have the leverage to do the work yourself. So you can swing it gently and still transmit a great deal of kinetic force to the item that you're working on. All right, next is an array of mechanics hammers. And these are the hammers, it's kind of a collection of all the different types of hammers, but a lot of people don't think of hammers when they think of mechanics, but the truth is that they usually have quite a few sets. They've got dead blow hammers, they, they've got uh, drilling hammers, they've got uh, rubber ham rubber faced hammers, they've got uh, uh, engineering hammers as well as ball peen hammers. All of these are used for different aspects of the mechanics field. And lastly, we've got rock hammers. Now as cool as that is, 
it's pretty small actually it'll fit well in your paw and honestly unless you're a rock hound or andy dupree you probably don't have any real use for a rock hammer but i thought i'd include it because they are pretty cute looking hammer uh and actually i guess we got one more one more hammer the, this is one i've got around the shop and if you got a welder so do you and that's a welding hammer this is for uh, knocking off slag and cleaning up welds and stuff like that and uh, I don't know, is there anything else you'd use a welding ham hammer for? I guess testing your welds maybe. Uh, but anyway, it, it is a hammer and, you know, there's a lot of people who do welding. So it's probably one you're going to see around. There's a lot of different styles. You don't always see them with this wire spun handle. But this is the one I think that's kind of the default hammer that you see. And then there's mallets. I don't, don't I'm not going into mallets. Don't, don't make me start talking about mallets. Oh, that, that is a whole nother series of conversations that we don't need to have right now. So no mallets today. There you go. There is your deep dive into the worlds of hammer or into the worlds of hammers, I should say. I know the difference between them can be, say it with me, striking. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't help myself. It was a little hanging fruit. But if you liked what you saw, if you learned something... Do me a favor. There, there's this little button down there. Don't worry. It's completely organic. No trans fats. Uh, no calories of any kind. Uh, you might cut your teeth on it, but why don't you chomp the old like button? Go on right there. Give it a chomp. Ah, there we go. That's a way of telling YouTube that you like what you saw here and that you appreciate what we do here in the channel. I hope you did appreciate it. I hope you learned something. Uh, if you want me to cover another set of hand tools, do another deep dive like this, comment down below. Let me know what you want to see doing next. I know I haven't done a lot of the brief history series. I'm looking to, to ramp that back up, get more than that. We've been focusing on the deals of the days and, and doing some other stuff. And I'm trying to bring back some of the content that we used to have. And uh, hopefully we'll do more of that here shortly. Anyway, you all take care, God bless, and as always, shine on.